Kia ora tato. Welcome everyone. There, uh, for those at the back standing, um, there are a few empty seats um, if you come or are willing to come a little bit closer. Everyone can probably see the, um, the screen, so I don't necessarily think you won't, won't see the screen. <laughs> Just another couple of people coming, so we'll just wait for them. Hi to my folks. Okay. Kia ora tato. No mai, haere mai. Welcome everyone. Uh, it's absolutely uh, delightful to see you all here today and um, uh, I think really um, the turnout is fantastic. Uh, I think a reflection of not only the, the speaker today but also the, the, uh, the nature of the presentation. So thank you all so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Andrew Gregg. I'm the manager here at the Elms um, and it's my great um, privilege and pleasure to, to welcome you. Um, for what's um, sure to be a, a highly interesting uh, presentation from Dr. Alistair Rees. Um, I'm going to just hand over to um, the president of the Tauranga Historical Society in a moment to um, just um, make a few comments. Uh, that's Julie Green. Um, but just, I guess, just a quick word to uh, acknowledge uh, the fact that this is, um, I understand, the first time that the Tauranga Historical Society and the Elms Foundation have had a, a combined meeting. Um, which I think is a really significant moment for us all um, and is one that we hope will, um, will continue in the future. And in fact, we have another one coming up in August with our speaker, Brett Payne, who's at the back there, who's going to be talking about um, uh, Reverend John Kinder's photography. So we very much look forward to, to that presentation. So really delighted to, to have both um, Toto <coughs> Historical Society members here and um, our wonderful Elms Guides as well. So thank you all so much for coming. Uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Julie Green now for um, uh, to make a few comments, and then following Julie, um, our Komatua Puiraki Ihaka will introduce our speaker today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew, and um, welcome everybody. Um, I. It's great to see this place filled with faces and people who are interested. And um, I, all I want to do is just give apologies from several people that have apologised that they can't be here. Um, Stephanie Smith, Kevin Ham, Shirley Arabin, Claude Hewlett, Steve Vergeist and Baker. I believe they've got an ongoing apology because they are busy at this time of the year. And... Um, one of your guides, what is her name? Lindsay Black. I was speaking to her earlier, so she sent her apology as well. Okay, so without further ado, let's get on. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first of all, I just want to explain that I will do a short mihi to... Um, for the purpose of this uh, gathering here today, to honour that, and also to for our our speaker, um, with with a small translation of it, and uh, generally my corridor will be in English. So, first of all, um, 
e papa ki tuana ngā tai ki mawa o i, whik, I whakanuki nuki hi, whakaneki nuki hi. I whiwa rere te e hōtu awa hene rua ki te wai. Ki tai wiwi, ki tai wawa, ki tai papa ki hona pū. Ki te whai au, ki te au mahana, ki hei mawi ora. That is a saying, or tauparapara we call it, which acknowledges the moana, mawau, and all those iconic places in Tauranga moana that Māori have honoured since we've since we've been in this area and of course bring it into today's world what we all enjoy and also acknowledge Mema or, or te Tauranga Historical Society, me te ao, mō reira, uh, he mihi aroha ki a koe, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, mō te tautoko mō te manaki ki a mātou. Mō reira, te rangatira, tēnā koe, tēnā koe. Just to acknowledge Alistair here and giving up his time to come and talk to us about his work that he's done. In particular, the this historical report, um, um, report on Te Papa Nabbath Vineyard. Um, Alistair uh, has a very long history in in this area as an historian. Um, has been his research has centred on a lot of the. Um, uh, how to the, what we call the Raupatu of the Whenua and Tauranga Mona for, for Māori, and that is the confiscation of our lands in the 1860s. Um, he, he has uh, academic qualifications in history and theology. In fact, he has a, um, a doctorate in, in theology and, and a master's of his, in history, and in particular, tikanga Māori. Uh, so... I'm sure you'd rather listen to him. So I may I introduce to you Alistair Reese. Kia ora tato. Tenore ki te atua, e manga rong ki te whenua, whakara pai te ngana tangata katoa, uh, ko te mihi tuatahi ki tō mātua mātua e te rangi uh, ki a koe e pā ko tēnei te mihi ki a koe mō tēnei hii runga uh, e tēnei ahi ahi. Uh, <coughs> te ahuri atu uh, ki ngā mana whenua uh, o tēnei rohi, uh, ngā i tama rāwaho uh, me ngā te tapu um, ko tēnei te mihi ki a, ki a koutou, um, ki a koe e te rangatira, uh, tēnā koe um, tūri mō tō pauhiri ki a hau a ki a mātou ka... Uh, Oh, ki a tātou i tēnei ahi ahi. Um, <coughs> ka huri atu uh, ki... Nau mai, <laughs> nau mai, nau mai, nau mai, whakatau mai uh, ngā karangatanga maha uh, nō ngā hau e whā uh, me ngā tangaratiri huki. So I've just really uh, responded uh, to uh, the greeting of Tuhi and welcomed you all from wherever you come from, the different winds, um, but, uh, and uh, te huriatu ki a koe, Andrew, uh, and the uh, Tauranga Historical Society. Thank you um, very much for uh, giving me the opportunity to stand before you this afternoon, and to you all who have um, braced yourselves in the midst of, uh, a, I'm sure, a busy Sunday afternoon, but also um, a cold uh, afternoon, uh, no mai. Cliff, good to see you here. Just honoured uh, uh, another um, scholar who is deeply immersed in the, in the scholarship of this area. I want to also um, acknowledge some friends who have tagged along just to make up the numbers in case that no one else came. <laughs> so that was that's really good to see you. Um, and uh, I want to uh, just make a special mention of the people that work here at, at the Elms and those that who are faithfully you come here. Um, day after day and week after week, and you kaitiaki this place, you look after this place uh, for us. 
so I want to acknowledge you. And I walked around the gardens before, and I thought, wow, what, what, you know, what a treasure this place is, and and how, how fortunate it is that we actually still have it as a term, this very little fragile space, I would call it. I want to say that there's, um, I'm presenting some things around, uh, as Pui said, around this area, particularly um, this area of land that we stand on. And there's many of you that will know more about this particular location and some of the things that happened on it. I have an area of interest within it. And I'm, I'm just thrilled that we can actually be together. And I'm sure that putting our voices together and our areas of interest together that we can uh, somehow get to understand something that closely uh, approaches, uh, excusing the postmodernists amongst us, but it closely approaches the truth. So um, I offer this today, and it's, uh, it's an opinion, and uh, it might not uh, stack up with your opinion, uh, but and I just want to say you're welcome to yours. And if you have something that you want to say to me afterwards, I'm very happy uh, to hear that. I um, it's a mixture because it's a, the um, historical um, society and because it's the elms, there is quite a bit of detail in it. Uh, and so I know that it, it there will be a mixture for some of you. You're coming into the space and you know probably you know enough to write on the back of a matchbox and yet there's others you know you've been speaking the story for years and years so I'm hoping that I'll be able to um, satisfy some of you but you, you know you can't uh, win all the people all the time so I know that there'll be uh, perhaps a little bit of um, um, struggle for some of you in the midst of this detail so I've been invited to speak this afternoon centered around what is called, um, has been termed the Anglican Apology. Uh, you probably didn't know that. I don't think it was advertised as that. I'm just put my face up there and says, come and hear this guy. But that's what you're going to hear about, eh? is about the background to the uh, Anglican uh, Apology that took place, uh, at least in, it, in the form of a motion, uh, a couple of months ago. Now, the Apology hasn't yet happened. Uh, that is going to be happening uh, uh, in Tauranga in the next two or three months, hopefully. But this is this is the apology that was um, agreed upon uh, by uh, the Anglican, the biannual Anglican Synod. So th I'll just read out a couple of um, parts <coughs> from it and then progress from there. It says, "This General Synod apologises to Ngati Tapu and Ngai Tamarawaho of Tauranga Moana and, in particular, to the Otamataha Trust." which represents him in this matter for the loss of the Tatapa mission lands and commits to continue to pray for a final and mutually agreeable settlement to the Tauranga Moana land case before the Waitangi Tribunal and notes that a parcel of land in Tauranga Moana of approximately 1,300 acres known as the Te Papa block is the subject of concern for the trust uh, representing Ngāti Tapu and Ngāi Tamaroa Wahu. It receives a report, Nabos Vineyard, towards reconciliation in Tauranga Moana, researched and presented by Dr. Alastair Rees, which details the concerns uh, regarding the disposal of this land by the Church Missionary Society, or Lands Board, to the colonial government in 1866. And it goes on to say that not only will this apology be made, but the Anglican Church itself will attempt to be involved in some kind of uh, restitutionary process that gives some, uh, what I guess in their words would uh, give some integrity uh, to the apology so that it is more uh, than uh, lip service. So this is essentially uh, what I'm wanting to address and I'm going to give you an, an historical account which is essentially a summary of the, of the report that I've written uh, and that was, as, as it said here, has been accepted uh, by, by the church. I'm going to, before I get into the historical account, I'm going to share with you uh, a, a little uh, biblical story. And it's not because uh, we're in a church this afternoon, but uh, because it's because this story called Naboth's Vineyard is actually a core motif uh, within the wider story of uh, Te Papa. And the story goes, it's actually out of 1 Kings 21. And, and very simply, this is the story. It's set in about 500 B.C., uh, and there was the king and queen of um, Israel at that time, or actually it was Judah, were um, Ahab and Jezebel. 
And there was uh, a family that lived down the road, uh, and the family's name well, the, was Naboth. So uh, Naboth had a vineyard, and it was a very apparently a very lovely vineyard, and uh, Ahab had eyes for it. So he went down to Ahab, and he said, um, would you uh, sell me your vineyard? Uh, because and I'll give you another piece of land for it so Naboth's response was this he said how could I give to you the inheritance of mine ancestors so he went away and Ahab went back to the went back to his castle and the scriptures uh, talk about the fact that he was moping around the castle sorry moping around yeah his castle and Jezebel comes up to him and says uh, you know what's wrong dear and uh, Ahab uh, said, well, um, you know, I wanted that bit of land and, and Naboth has turned me down. And Jezebel says, aren't we the king and queen of this land? Wait, I'll fix it. So uh, what she did was that she went down uh, to Naboth's village and she uh, bribed the elders of the village to hold a meeting uh, and to have a time where they actually accused, uh, falsely accused Naboth of... Um, of uh, blaspheming against God and blaspheming against the king and the queen. And as a, as a result of that, the summary justice was that he was taken outside and stoned. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and by that means, um, Ahab, he was able to secure, sorry, yeah, Ab Ahab was able to secure the vineyard. Uh, and it's be called Naboth's Vineyard. You will see in the narrative as we go through that, 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 this, is, uh, that this comes up this Naboth's vineyard motif comes up in terms of the, uh, the reference to this block of land, which is uh, called Te Papa. One thing before I leave that, um, welcome, come in. Um, and before I leave that, uh, it's interesting that that uh, motif of Naboth's vineyard was actually a re recurring theme uh, throughout the Mortu. Uh, and you will find reference to it in, uh, in uh, Dunedin and Wellington and Waitara and in other places where Māori thinking that the crown were a Christian government, they would appeal to them on the basis of this Naboth vineyard. And, and so across the country, they, they often referred to their own localities as Naboth's vineyard. They didn't get too much of a response uh, back. So now... Uh, turning to um, to this place where we where we are dwelling right now, it's called, as many of you will know, or most of you know, it's called Tauranga, which means uh, a variety of meanings, but one of the meanings is called a safe haven. And this place of uh, Tauranga has been a safe haven for umpteen centuries. Um, people just uh, have different ideas of how long, but I've just listed there some of the people groups. Uh, that have occupied particularly this area uh, of, um, of Te Papa uh, and um, through the different centuries um, leading up to today. Just to remind you, the piece of land uh, that we're talking about, this Te Papa block, is this block, the peninsula that starts down here on the strand and that is bounded on both sides uh, by stretches of water and goes all the way back through to where what we call Gate Pa or Pukahinahina. So that it's that it's this uh, peninsula uh, on which the uh, I guess you could say that the modern um, uh, city of Tauranga uh, was founded. I'm going to now just chart uh, something of the story of how it was that this block of land Te Papa came to be in the hands of a mission organization called the Church Mission Society. So um, the Church Mission Society first came to New Zealand in 1814 and they had their headquarters uh, up in uh, Pai here. But from early as uh, 1826, they received, uh, sorry, the Church Missionary Society sent ships down to this area, to Tauranga Moana, and their first uh, reason for doing that was actually to get supplies, to take them back up to the mission stations up in Pai here. And so there's this um, character called Henry Williams who was a formidable leader uh, of the CMS and he first came here in 1826 uh, and, and his diary records being well welcomed into the harbour where, uh, and where they um, 
they loaded up with potatoes and took them back up to the uh, up to Pai here. He came uh, several times down here, not just Williams, but uh, several other missionaries as well. And it's recorded in his, in his journal is that um, already by the second visit, uh, local uh, tangata whenua were asking uh, for CMS to bring a missionary here. But um, at that stage, Williams didn't think that the environment was particularly suitable to establish a mission. He didn't think that the political uh, environment was safe enough at that stage. Uh, so they, they didn't do it at that time. One of the things that I want to uh, paint here is uh, the, the understanding that contrary to many uh, accounts of the missionary involvement, that they were not just interlopers who came here without uh, any uh, uh, invitation or, or without some involvement of the, of the local people. It seems, uh, if you look through the history, the historical accounts, earlier on missionaries was sort of like in hagiography. They were, they were all these great saints. Uh, and then as history has a want to do, the fashion has changed and now they have gone right to the other end of the continuum and missionaries are considered uh, probably the you know, persona non grata at the, at the highest level. Uh, so I'm, I'm trying to d just bring a little bit of a balance to that story to say that the entrance of CMS to this area uh, was not because of their own uh, ambition only, but because of these invitations uh, that came to them. On his third visit, uh, they came uh, and they witnessed uh, the devastation, the aftermath of the sacking of the Otamataha Pa uh, by Ngāti Maru. Uh, and he says here, um, I went to the Pa which within this last fortnight has been subdued by Ngāti Maru. We witnessed every mark of desolation. When last here we anchored abreast of this place, and then there were many hundreds of men, women and children. Now all was silent. Their houses and fences burnt, dead dogs, pigs on all sides and human bones in many places a dreadful evidence of the real temp temporal situation of this people. So he was remarking about what happened in 1828 here, just, just over the back of, of where we're sitting uh, through that invasion. Henry Williams was a, quite a remarkable man. That's why I'm spending a little bit of time on here. But it's, it's really um, his leadership, in a sense, that laid the foundation for the founding of this mission station here. I won't read what's there. Um, but I just want to point out to a beautiful, it's an engraving that he, it's of a painting that he took, oh sorry, that he made himself. And if you look at this uh, engraving, you'll see uh, his um, boat called the Active, and it's in the middle of a whole lot of uh, whakapaua, or uh, war canoes. And so what Henry Williams did was he sailed down from up north, up in Paihia, uh, in the midst of these, of, um, of the of the Towa uh, in the midst of the the warriors that were coming down from Ngapuhi uh, to do their uh, to do their best down here, and it's a it's a remarkable uh, story to read some of his journals as he's engaging with some of the chiefs there to say really do you need to do this is there not another way that this can uh, uh, can unfold, but anyway he, he talks about being here in the harbour and watching those skirmishes between Ngapuhi. Uh, and Ngaitarangi, and I imagine Ngaitarangi Nui at that time. So um, after a period of time, um, they continued to receive these invitations uh, by mana whenua to come here. Uh, there was invitations as far as to Waharoa over in the Matamata district and from Tapsil down in Makatu. Uh, so these invitations uh, were finally accepted uh, by uh, CMS and they decided that the time was right in order to start up this uh, mission station. So um, in, um, sorry, <coughs> there we go. Uh, the, first, the first missionaries that established the base here uh, around where we're standing were uh, William Wade, who was actually a Baptist minister. The CMS mission is actually an Anglican-based mission um, group. There were others, uh, but mainly it was uh, Anglican. And then Philip King, uh, who was uh, a carpenter, he was John King, who son, who was a um, represent, uh, sorry, a CMS minister up north. They established a base here, 
and they were assisted at that time by um, some Māori, local Māori. Uh, one of them is a very significant man called uh, Machu, uh, Machu Tahu, who was actually a tohunga uh, of Ngaitarangi and who was a survivor of the Ngāti Maru uh, invasion here at Otamataha. There was, uh, in other um, skirmishes were happening around the area. There was the, the conflicts between uh, Ngāti Hauwa, uh, Te Arawa, and the and and the other some of the uh, hapu here. So this actually this mission station was actually abandoned in 1835. But in 1838, uh, probably uh, the most significant personage uh, associated with this uh, mission, uh, Alfred Brown and his family arrived here from uh, Waharoa, which is just on the other side of Matamata. Again, that mission station was closed down because of, uh, of um, some of the inter-tribal, uh, inter-hapu warfare that was going on here. And so Alfred Brown uh, settled here uh, on this land in uh, 1838, and Alfred Brown brought his family uh, and um, established his long life um, here. Again, I want to stress that it was not just a, a Pākehā institution that was established here, but it was very much uh, a, a mission station that was uh, built upon relationship. And uh, two of the key persons in terms of the leadership of Māori amongst that time was the well-known um, uh, leader from Ngāti Hauwā, uh, Wiramu Tamihana. And Wirimu Tamihana, some of you might know him, he's, refer he's referred to by the, the name of the Kingmaker. He was the one who really, um, together with others, had the vision to establish the Kingitanga movement. And uh, he was baptised here uh, by Brown in 1839. And the other person, as I've already mentioned, uh, Matu uh, Tahu, was also uh, became a teacher here. I want to read this out. This is a, a quote from Tahu because um, it, it, this, uh, his statement carries a lot in it. But it also, uh, it, it, well, I'll, I'll read it and then just explain a little bit. So Tahu, um, Tahu writes this. This is writing to the missionaries. And you get to see the tension that, that is um, already uh, seated here, already in the ground uh, in terms of their relationship. He says, you're not satisfied with us. And you often express a fear that our religion is only lip service, that it has no root in our hearts. You forget what we were and what we have thrown away, our cannibalism, our murders, our infanticide, our tapus, which were gods to us. What prevents our return to these things but religion? So uh, Tahu was a keen uh, um, disciple, a keen embracer of Christianity. But he was noting already a, uh, something that was taking place at that time amongst the missionaries, their unwillingness to really accept, you know, are these, you can, in broad terms, you're saying, have they really become Christians or are they, will they revert to type? I mean, that's, you know, that's kind of the back story. Uh, and he was putting that out there to say, hey, um, you know, we're really, we're genuine in what we've done. A uh, lot to be talked about in that area, but I just wanted to signal that to you. So after being here for a little bit of time, um, Alfred Brown began negotiations for the land here. And uh, ultimately, they purchased CMS uh, via Brown, purchased two blocks of land. The first one uh, was, um, the first was 350 acres, uh, and the second one was around 1,000 acres. So... That negotiation took, uh, took place over a period of time. And you have to ask the question, why was it that a um, little mission station was interested in purchasing what amounts to 1,333 acres of land from local Māori? So this is, as we're able to discern uh, from his journal, these are a couple of reasons why uh, Alfred Brown uh, purchased that. He says... He's saying, to show them by this act that we have no present intention of leaving them. So really what Brown was saying was that to overcome the suspicion of local Māori about the nature of the mission, he's saying, if we invest in this area in substance, they'll know that we're here for the long haul and we haven't just come for a quick uh, whatever and, and then away. So that was the first one. 
The second one became ex um, even more important, I think, to him over a period of time. It's what he called this, the tide of immigration that is setting upon us. It is no doubt in my mind that in the early days that Alfred Brown uh, was totally um, concerned about the welfare of Māori and the kind of uh, infiltration that was coming, the influx that was coming and the type of immigrants that were coming. And so in one way, CMS basically purchased this block of land of Tipapa as a land bank, as a land bank against what he saw was the incursions of these um, immigrants who these missionaries didn't really uh, like too much. Uh, in Kororareka, up in Russell, they called it the place where Satan has his dominion. And the reason they, uh, they called it that was not because of Māori, but was because of the basic the drunkenness and the debauchery and the violence of the settlers that were coming in. So they were not really impressed uh, with the sort of people that were coming in. So here's another. Um, this is the CMS Parent uh, Trust Board that was in London, and this is their explanation of why they purchased this block of land. And this quote, I think, becomes very significant as we go down the story and understand what happened to it. The parent committee said, we have acquired and it's retained under a solemn trust that it should be applied to the benefit of the native race in the church, that it should never be bartered or sold for the mere purpose of raising money. The natives who gave the land for the benefit of themselves and their posterity would have just ground of complaint against us if we sold the land for a military settlement. Okay, so that's, in a way, you can see the, 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 the reasons that they actually um, put in their own trust deeds around this block of land of Te Papa and why they, why they had it. After the purchase, and I use the word purchase uh, advisedly, it has become a controversial term. What we are seeing, I'm sure, is actually a cultural clash here. We're seeing two cultural... Um, systems coming together and by that I mean is the the perspective that people have about land ownership. So the Europeans come in with their understanding of what it means to own land and uh, and what title looks like and Māori have their own uh, understanding at that time of what uh, land ownership looks like and I think it's clear as you go through it that these two cultures actually um, <coughs> They, they seem to agree, but really in the long run, I don't think they agree. Because what happened was very early on, Brown ran into some difficulties around the purchase of, the, um, of, this, of this block. And what, because people continued to live on here, they were still uh, growing gardens, they were still using it as their base for going uh, for fishing. In, in some ways, it seems that for Māori, nothing much had changed. There might have been perhaps a new, uh, and I'm, it's my term, it might have been a new rangatira involved in the kaitiaki of the land. Uh, and the other thing that was, uh, I guess, the controversy is that around the purchase and money and how it was exchanged, and there were some that actually said, hey, we didn't get our piece. Uh, we didn't get anything from it. That those people over there sold it to you, but... but, but we didn't, we didn't get anything. And so he, he ran in, into these kinds of difficulties. Some missionaries have received a bad rap uh, around land purchase, and I think some of it is um, understandable and has some substance. But I think as far as Brown's concerned, uh, he didn't really have personal land ambitions. Uh, I believe uh, that the reasons that he gave earlier on uh, for the purchase of uh, Te Papa, uh, they stand. Uh, he also made it clear that he didn't uh, endorse the large purchases by other uh, missionaries, um, some of your namesakes uh, up, up north. Uh, he didn't feel it was actually a good idea for missionaries to be buying large tracts of land for themselves. He also, as a good evangelical, had another dilemma. He... Um, I think without a doubt that Brown was first and foremost an evangelist. He came here to preach the gospel, to preach the good news, and to teach. He says this, I'm between the devil and the deep blue sea. In time, the government would require more land. 
to steer clear of giving offence to the powers that be, that is the government, and at the same time to sustain our character as guardians of the natives will require much of the wisdom that cometh from above. So he began to see inexorably he was drawn into a political reality that as an evangelical he didn't really want to be involved in. He just wanted to teach the Bible, I guess, in, in simple terms. But he found himself immersed into the political realities of the time. These were many and varied, but one of the big ones was the Interhapu warfare. It was uh, the aftermath of what we call the musket wars and all of these things. And people turned to uh, Brown and, and they were involved in many times in peacemaking activities. It's not something that he would have been prepared for uh, in his training. Uh, and the other thing was this aspect of people wanting to buy land, wanting to have land, and his um, sense of justice to stand against that. <coughs> he says, The tide of immigration is setting in upon us with springtide violence, and it will be well if the poor natives are not borne away in its restless course. Much, however, of the threatened evil may yet, under God's blessing, be averted if the powers vested by the British government and, Cap and Captain Hobson whose arrival in the Bay of Islands, as I understand, daily expected, are full and comprehensive. So here he is, this religious evangelical, now actually looking to political means to somehow alleviate the situation as he understood it in the land. So as you know that the Treaty of Waitangi was signed uh, in, in Waitangi in, in, in 1840. According to um, uh, Claudia Orange, I think you, uh, she has said that without a doubt that the, the Treaty of Waitangi was, would not have been signed if it wasn't for the intermediary role played by the missionaries. So people, not so much Brown, but others found themselves, sorry, missionaries found themselves in negotiating between the British Crown uh, and Iwi this, uh, this treaty which uh, we call, uh, some of us call uh, Te Kawanata or the, Kawan, or the Covenant. So Brown, this is his, um, again, one showing something of the tension that he felt. He says, the missionary has little to do with politics, but in the sifting time through which our people are passing, a word spoken in season by the missionaries has doubtless diminished the number of those who would otherwise have been in arms <coughs> against the crown. So in a sense, he ended up supporting uh, the signing of the treaty. And uh, as many of you will know, the treaty was signed here in Tauranga, that he mediated that, uh, under and James Stack was the other missionary who actually witnessed that. Uh, 21 signatories of local people um, signed uh, the treaty here in Tauranga. And probably the most important aspect of that treaty that relates to what we're talking about today is the second article, which says, Her Majesty the Queen of England, etc., etc., uh, promises... Uh, that they would have full, exclusive, and undisturbed possession of their lands and estate. One of the lesser known things around the signing of the treaty that was established was the commission under people like uh, Godfrey. So the, uh, the British Crown said, okay, all land that had been sold uh, or purchased prior to 1840 will go through a commission. So they set up a commission to see whether those transactions were legitimate or not. So uh, Commissioner Godfrey uh, in, uh, finally arrived here in 1844, and this Te Papa block was put before the commission. Uh, and ultimately, uh, Godfrey uh, decided, yes, that that was a, uh, a just transition uh, and that the CMS title should stand. Others have said, and I read, that the commission was at best perfunctory and at worst papered over obvious inconsistencies in the evidence presented. If you, see, if you read uh, around that commission and see what happened there, you will see that there were several uh, representatives from Tangata Whenua who objected uh, to the process or the sale of this 1,333 acres. Uh, but they were just really dismissed as being mischief makers. Uh, I don't want to make a, a total pronouncement on that, but I just want to uh, uh, mention it to say that there was, uh, it was showing some of the the difficulties and the controversies around the piece of land that must have been in the minds uh, of, uh, of Māori uh, at that time. 
So going on from that, they occupied the land, uh, 1844, post-Treaty uh, of Waitangi, and then uh, we know that uh, the settlers were coming, arriving into New Zealand in, in, in large numbers, and actually the missionaries uh, at that point in time generally were um, um, enjoying what I would call really good relations with most Māori across the motu. I mean, there were some exceptions to that. Uh, in fact, it was the settlers who didn't like the missionaries uh, for the most part. And the reason for that is that the missionaries were uh, standing against uh, some of the violence, the drunkenness, and also some of the shady uh, land deals that were being conducted by the New Zealand company Wakefield and others. And they, you know, they wrote to England, uh, they, they, they stood and they spoke quite a lot about that um, sort of thing. And so um, they were actually called uh, Philo Māori. Uh, by by the settlers, which in today's language would be Maori lovers, so that's so the settlers that were coming saw the missionaries as being uh, a hindrance or an impediment to their lust for land, really. So um, in the 1860s, though, uh, you would see that I, this is what I my own sort of analysis on it is that there was a change or a shift in allegiance from uh, the missionaries. Uh, in terms of their relationship with Māori and the relationship to the Crown. Now, I'm speaking in really simplistic terms here, and you know you could drill down into that to do a lot more um, work on it. But just essentially, for example, people like Brown, people like Hatfield, Octavius Hatfield, uh, down in uh, Kapiti, they stood against the Taranaki War. So the Taranaki War in Waitara was where, well, most people understand that the land wars broke out in the first place. And that was a, about the selling of land by a sub-chief. And many of the missionaries actually opposed that sale and they also opposed the Crown policy when the Crown sent troops into Waitara uh, and was the outbreak of the, of the missionary um, sorry, the outbreak of the, of the land wars. So that was, their, that was their first off position on these things. The second thing is that in, in the first instance, they also supported uh, the king movement, the kingitanga. Uh, I think mainly because of Brown and others' relationship with Wurimu Tamihana, the kingmaker. Uh, but eventually, after a period of time, they decided, and Brown was one of the main people in this area, decided that the king movement the establishment of a king uh, was a disloyalty to the crown. In their view, as evangelicals, this disloyalty to the crown was equal, equal to being disloyal to God. So uh, this is uh, this um, ultimately when the when Cameron came and when Gray sent the troops into Waikato uh, and they uh, and they went through the Waikato and, and engaged in the various battles. Eventually. You could see in terms of the rhetoric uh, in the journals that the language changed and ultimately led Brown to say something like this. He said, the Māori should be signally punished before they return to him from whom they have so grievously revolted. So that was, uh, he was seeing there that this was what's called uh, a, re a rebellion. So this putake o tereri, this source of this, of 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 the anger that was emerging in the land from Taranaki, Waikato, and eventually in Tauranga Moana, who was supporting the Waitangi, uh, sorry, the Waikato uh, tribes, Ngati Piro were coming through here with their supplies, etc. So this area here was a real conduit, a real gateway of support uh, for the for the uh, Kingitanga people, and so the Crown uh, sent their troops into um, into Tipapa. Uh, and they eventually um, they occupied these lands around here. First of all, even though uh, Brown was against uh, what was happening in Waikato, he said um, the properties of CMS uh, at this place are under the direction, uh, direction and management of the land board appointed by the society. So he writes to the Crown and he says, Look, listen, um, you will really upset everything if you uh, occupy here. And he said, we don't want a repeat of the Taranaki situation by your involvement in here and not reading the situation right. So even though he was, a, in a sense, supportive of Crown's involvement in Taranaki, uh, sorry, in Waikato, it seems that he was not, in the first instance, supportive of, um, 
of the, of the troops being here. But according to one of his biographers, this is what this is his uh, read ultimately. He says, like the other missionaries in South Auckland, Brown, torn between the loyalty to the Māoris amongst whom he laboured so long and his own race, did not hesitate to act as an uh, unofficial officer for his own side. Now I've put that in bold. And that's <laughs> my 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 interpretation. So. This was Venel's analysis of it. He said, ultimately, Brown came down on his on the side of the crown or on the side of his own people, which leads us to the skirmishes that began here, uh, or the battles that happened here in Tauranga Moana. First of all, the uh, the Battle of uh, Gate Pa, the Battle of Pukahinahina, uh, and the Battle of Te Ranga. The troops were uh, all based around here. You know where the redoubts are around the corner, and the camps were here, and officers were in different, um, had at that stage taken over some of the mission houses. Um, and on the night before the battle itself, um, whether by invitation or how that happens, we don't know, but the um, troops, the sorry, the officers of the troops, of the Crown troops, had communion here, right where we stand. Uh, in, on, on the elms here. That story has entered into the local folklore. Uh, it's, um, there are different versions of it, there are different perspectives in it, but I just want to say is it had happened uh, and it still sits uh, within the stories of the land here that um, Brown, he gave hospitality to the leaders of the troops that were engaging at Pukahinahina and then ultimately at Te Ranga which of course now have been deemed by most people to see uh, to be an overreaction by the Crown, in fact, a, a wrong response by the Crown. So he was seen uh, by many at that stage to have crossed a line uh, between his, um, his faithfulness or his pastoral care and concern for tangata whenua and became a supporter of the crown. Now, it's probably slightly more nuanced than that, but in the eyes of many, that was how they perceived. So, uh, ultimately, uh, the crown troops were brought in. Uh, sorry, uh, the crown troops that were here, they began, uh, they came here with an expectation, actually, that this land would be theirs. And that was part of the crown policy, to have this okati, to have it from kafia to here, to create... Um, townships that would be able to uh, be fortifications, as it were, against the incursions of Māori, and also the Crown were looking for places where they could um, establish um, their own townships. And so they began to survey this land here, the Tipapa land, and uh, again, Brown's in an uproar about this. Uh, he's writing to the governor and saying, hey, what's this about? You know, um, this is... Um, this is something, basically what he's saying is, is not right, it's not just what you're doing. Uh, at the same time, this plot, block of land, Te Papa, was actually under the control of a land board. And it, the land board was uh, Brown here, Bishop William Williams in Gisborne, and um, a man called Burroughs, Reverend Burroughs in Auckland, who was the secretary. And there was tension within this land board of what to do uh, with this Pipapa land. Because as you can see from what I've said already, the Crown had designs on this land. This was an absolute jewel in terms of the uh, prospective settlement, you know, with the beautiful harbour here, uh, fertile soil, and this, you know, really, um, really hospitable area to settle. So the Crown were making these overtures all the way through, more than overtures, actually they were occupying. Uh, and the, the so... Amongst CMS, they were in this discussion already, you know, behind the scenes. You know, what are we going to do now? What's, you know, what shall we do? And uh, so Burroughs in Auckland was removed from the local situation. He, he was somebody who actually uh, took a, upon himself to um, just uh, to lease land out to decide what to do with um, Te Papa. So he actually leased land out to people without Brown's permission and even without... Um, Burroughs, uh, sorry, without Williams' per, um, permission. We're about three quarters of the way through, a bit more than three quarters. You right? Okay. Yeah. You can have, um, you want to open it?
Do you want to take your jackets off? So we have this um, situation with the discussions around this Te Papa block now. It's up for grabs in, in some ways. What to do with it? So Brown write to Secretary Burroughs in Auckland. He says, because Burroughs was really, in my view, was the one that wanted to do the deal with the Crown, essentially. He was, he was um, a pragmatist, and he was not engaged on the ground with local people, uh, and he just he felt that the best thing to do with it was to, uh, to utilise it uh, to the best of their ability. So Brown writes to Burroughs, I shall not at present take up the trouble of supposing that the government will possess Te Papa to the exclusion of the mission station. Their bill is not yet law, and there may be more obstacles than they anticipate to their occupancy of Nabos Vineyard. So already you could see that was entering into the missionary mind a sense that, hey, wait a minute, this block of land that we're on could become a, is a place of potential betrayal. So he writes that to Burroughs, and then a bit later on, William Williams writes this to, uh, to Brown. He says, it is possible that Te Papa may cease to be a missionary station. It is indeed probable because it happens to be Nabos Vineyard. So William Williams had already decided it's you know it's fait accompli. This this block of land is definitely uh, a place of betrayal. So the conversation there's lots of letters backwards and forwards between Burroughs, between the um, the parent committee back in London, and uh, between um, Williams and and Brown. One of the things is that actually they never consulted uh, with Mana Whenua. They actually never consulted with the people from whom the land was given. There is one shining light <laughs> uh, in, this, in this story of, of, of the kind of the missionary involvement in this locality. His, man, name, his name was Thomas Grace. He says, this, should, this is the answer, he says, to your problem. He said, just make every native deacon a member of the land board and publish an annual statement of accounts in Māori. <laughs> um, William Williams uh, sort of, Response: He says the natives have got no right, as a matter of right, to make any inquiry about the land proceeds. Maori have been told repeatedly, as they had in no way defrayed expenses of the mission, the proceeds of the society's land carried the burden. So, in that discussion, he closed it down and said, "You know, we have no need to go out uh, and canvass that." The parent committee says this: Our committee has resolved that while upholding the principle of retaining the land as a sacred trust for the native race, they will nevertheless, if the Bishop of Waipu and Archdeacon Brown think it expedient, yield in the instance to the pressure of the government. So basically they were saying we make a stand, but actually at the end of the day, you guys on the ground um, make the call. In response to settler criticism over retention of the land, he says, oh, the, the Venn says from England, that land was acquired, and I've read this to you before at the beginning. I'll just read this, uh, the last part. The natives who gave the land for the benefit of themselves, uh, etc. So we have therefore declined all offers. If the government need the land for public purposes, they may take it from us, but we shall then claim compensation. The final result was, despite misgivings, four-fifths of this land of Te Papa was given to the Crown in 1886 and exchanged for one-fifth of the surveyed land. Ultimately, that one-fifth of land was alienated or was sold on by 1870, apart from 17 acres of the land, and we're standing on part of it now, was um, held by Brown and his family. It's always puzzled me why, uh, let me just go to this one here. This is Whitaker, who was the colonial, sorry, the land secretary in Auckland. He says, we accept your offer. It's a very liberal one. It's always puzzled me why was it that the CMS actually gifted this land? I just had a bit of a... Um, an epiphany a little while ago, and it's untestable at the moment, but my sense is that, and part of the trust deed is that the offence would be if any of this land was sold for the gain of the church. I'm thinking that this was 
perhaps, um, with, as I say, I don't have that record, perhaps that was the CMS's response saying, we, we, we unwillingly yield the land, but we won't take the money for it. Except the one-fifth. Uh, I just put that out as a possibility. It doesn't, as you'll see later, it doesn't actually mitigate things in a great deal. Uh, I won't read this um, just because of time, but just to say is that the Crown, and this is going to be very interesting in the times that we're coming, we're coming up to now in terms of some things that are happening around the city. Uh, the Crown realised uh, that the land was under trust and that CMS had it under trust. This was all around the, the, the ropatu or the, the, um, the uh, confiscation because originally this Tipapa land was, con was thought by the Crown to be within their confiscation zone. Uh, they thought that that was what, how it was, but actually ultimately they understood that actually it's outside of the ropatu because it's privately owned. And they decided that they had to, um, the only way they could get around that was by if the CMS convey the land to them and then they'd have an Act of Parliament in order to facilitate this. The Act was, there's no evidence of the Act ever taking place at all. But the key thing here is that the Crown recognised uh, that the land was held in <coughs> trust uh, by CMS for Māori. So, <coughs> the Waitangi's Tribunal's conclusion is the awarding of a Crown grant to the CMS for the Te Papa blocks following an investigation in 1844 was in breach of the principle of active participation. This was because the Crown failed to ascertain and acknowledge the conditional nature of the original transaction and wrongly granted title to the CMS. What they're saying is there that the type of transaction was not a sale in a Western sense, but a kaitiakitanga type of, um, um, of, of, of arrangement. They finalise it by saying, in its acquisition of the CMS blocks in 1867, the Crown further breached the principles of the treaty. While Māori were not legally the beneficial owners of the CMS land at Te Papa, the Crown was aware that the CMS had always maintained that it held the land for the benefit of Māori. The Crown disregarded this trusteeship role when it acquired the blocks from the society and so failed both to act in good faith towards Māori and to protect <coughs> their interests. So my s summary is as an historian and essentially as a theologian is that CMS, in the midst of all the vicissitudes and the difficulties and the mental anguish, which I completely understand, ultimately supported the Crown in Tingitanga, in the land issues, and ultimately here in Te Papa. I th believe that they failed to consult with Māori. They failed to hear the com original complaints at the Godfrey Commission in 1844. They failed to hold to the original aims of the trust. They were in a place, as the uh, parent um, society recommended, that they actually refuse the Crown overtures and take uh, the, the consequences. And they could have continued what I would see as their prophetic task to speak out against injustice. On the basis of that, the Anglican Church has accepted this position really and said, yes, we were at fault. Our mission was at fault, that we were, in a sense, guilty of a betrayal over the Te Papa land. Let me just do two more slides to finish this, and then I'm happy to, ex there are questions, I don't know. Um, I'm concerned for the reputation of Brown. I, I believe that just as we are in today, it's very complex times. Who, could, who can stand amongst the mind unit uh, analysis that we're doing you know, on Brown? So uh, he's like all of us, I believe. You know, a man, of, I think, of integrity, but with some mixture and, 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 and surrounded by others who I think actually put him under more pressure than he needed around this. But this is an interesting, I think, uh, account in the local uh, paper here. So this is Brown, the summation in his biography, one of those rare souls to whom religion was as real and natural as the air he breathed. He came as a missionary amongst heathen people, 
young and energetic, full of zeal for his chosen work. He was no land seeker. No breath of scandal ever fell upon his name. His one dominating thought was the welfare of his Maori flock. Dot, dot, dot. And it was noted in the account of his tangi or his funeral that there was but a poor attendance of members of the native race to which he had devoted his life. At the end of his life, after laboring for close to 50 years at his tangi, there were few uh, of his flock um, that came. So I think that I'm going to finish with two slides. One is this is a slide showing the downtown Tauranga and the one fifth, four fifth. Uh, it's not very clear, but it, it shows the, the blocks that were actually given uh, or retained by the C by CMS. One of those blocks is this very significant block here, uh, lot 45, which is where the old town hall was, uh, and over which uh, some quite strong political engagement has taken place. I put that up there because I think it's still uh, something uh, that needs to be talked about. Finally, I want to uh, ask the question about restoring the tau. What does it look like to restore? Tau is, is really like a place of rest, a place of peace. If this is recently the city of Tauranga, uh, the council people have actually uh, put out a plan called about the heart of the city. And what does the restoration of this, of this tau or this restoration of well-being, peace, safety, this safe place for all people, what uh, could that look like? What might the heart, what might reconciliation look like in Tauranga Moana in the 21st century? And uh, I've put up a photo of just uh, of where we are. Uh, this, is this is where we are right now. Have I got that right? I think, yeah. And this is uh, what's called the Cliff Road and this piece of land here, uh, which is owned uh, by the Tauranga Council. I want to finish by saying that it's my uh, personal prayer that the uh, Anglican uh, apology leads uh, to sub some stud substantial restoration or restitution uh, for mana whenua uh, around this piece of land which is uh, known as uh, uh, Te Papa. Nō reira kua mutua nai nei, a tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, a tēnā te katoa. Kia ora, Alistair, on behalf of everyone, I'd just like to thank you for what's been a, a most uh, interesting and thought-provoking presentation. Um, Alistair's agreed to take some questions, so um, I'll open it up to the floor. What I would just like to do is um, give you the microphone, so that because um, I am recording this um, presentation, so it will enable your voice to be captured in the presentation. Questions? Um, in your... Thanks for your talk. Very interesting. In your summary, you, you pointed out that Brown's primary welfare uh, concern was for the welfare of his Maori flock. Uh, and you emphasised that. And yet earlier, you pointed out that when push came to shove, he sided with the Crown against the tongue of General Whenua. I'm a little puzzled by the conflict between the two statements. And uh, it was that just political expediency on Brown's part, or change of heart, or what? Thanks for the question. Um, also, I, I have actually a copy of these reports here. Um, unfortunately, they're really expensive. I, I'm not making any money out, out of it. There's a, a full report is $50. Um, it's colour. Photocopied, and there's a summary which is uh, twenty-five dollars. If anyone's interested, if you, you, you you're welcome to um, to purchase that. It's always difficult uh, to analyze motivation. I I read, uh, I think it was uh, Venel's uh, comment about that, where he said that his prime motivation was the well-being of of his flock. I didn't say that. That was a quote, right? I would be more nuanced, uh, but I did try to paint a picture of someone who was torn. Someone who, I would say, from understanding something of his theology, I would say that Brown's first priority in his own mind, right, 
was to God. He would look to be, in his own mind, to be faithful to God. And he would see the crown, uh, um, the settlers, Māori, as being kind of uh, a subset within that mission. And that he would be seeking to understand, okay, in his prayer and then, you know, his follow-up um, activities, who do, you know, how do I behave in that way? That's where we, there was a quote that I, from his journal which says, remember, he said, I will need this great wisdom that comes down from above in order uh, to be able to um, find my way through that. So, look, I, I want my own sense is that he was tortured by this, these questions. I, and I would liken it, for example, to uh, for, um, in case I become totally self-righteous in my judgment, you know, at present situations about Tino Rangatiratanga and the foreshore and seabed and, and all of these, they're, they're big questions that, that are highly complex. At the end of the day, he made a call, uh, and I'm saying he made a call within the land board, his signatures on the conveyance of the, of the, of the land uh, to the crown. In that instance, he was saying, that's the best thing to do. But I'm not wanting to say that it was an easy choice for him at all. Mike, um. Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. You've given us a lot to think about this afternoon, quite a lot to take in at once. Is it possible to have a copy? <laughs> Is it possible to have a copy of your talk, or if not, a summary of it? Recorded this talk. Yeah, I've recorded the talk. Yeah. Um, my daughter said to me, Dad, just remember, um, you know, not everyone's going to want the detail. Uh, but I didn't know if I'd have another shot, so I thought I'd better give you <laughs> something to chew on. Uh, you know, it's been over um, working on this project since about 2003. So it's been, you know, in terms of mulling it over, and uh, um, I realized that. I'm that is, you know, you've had to absorb a big meal. So apologies for that. Um, I just, uh, you know, hope that something falls out of it for you that um, you can, doesn't give you indigestion, but you can chew over well and, and it, it'll come out well. Mm. Thanks very much for your presentation this afternoon. Uh, highly interesting, I like the details. What land or properties did uh, Brown uh, own personally here or elsewhere? And so as I understand it, he actually did negotiate to buy some land down towards Apotiki, uh, but that r raised a bit of controversy at the time, and uh, he dropped the idea. And look, to my knowledge, the 17 acres here was that which he ended up with. There may be others in the room that have a, a more precise understanding, of, but that's what my knowledge is, yeah. Um, I just wondered what role you think organisations like local government, Tauranga City Council, have in this reconciliation as well? I think they have a major role uh, because uh, uh, there is actually uh, a whakatauki uh, that actually says it was land that was lost, it must be land that is returned. I know that, and we all know this in terms of this reconciliatory kind of momentum, you can never replace that which is lost. But I think that it, it would convey something uh, of the heart of the city if Tauranga City Council is genuine about actually using that living terminology and it's not just a you know a PR byline, that they could uh, listen and listen deeply uh, to the the corridor of mana whenua around this story, you know, and then say, okay, let's get involved in this healing process. That we're actually more it's more about than more than just building bricks and mortar, you know, museums, libraries, actually. We're actually wanting a, a place where people can dwell and we can dwell with integrity and we can dwell 
you know, with healing. So in my view that uh, although we we're involved in ongoing discussions, I think they're just really beginning with the Crown and with Tauranga City, that Tauranga City Council has an integral role to play in the potential for us to move forward. And my hope would be that, for example, that this area of the Elms, which <coughs> I've said is a treasure, it's an absolute treasure, we don't actually have much left in of any historical significance. And I mean that not just as a museum artifact, but actually as a living place that actually reveals our identity and tells the story of who we are uh, and actually returns something of the mana uh, to people who have been whakaitied or, or, or belittled uh, in the midst of this process. So my appeal uh, would be to the council to say, do something uh, out of the ordinary and bring your hearts to this engagement and say, okay, what? not, not how difficult it's going to be, but how, what could we do if we're a visionary in some way in creating a city uh, that had a beating heart within it? Any other questions? Yes, Jocelyn. I just wanted to ask you, um, if it, I think you gave a talk um, at Holy Trinity, might have been in a service, was that several years ago? Was several years yes, ago. and I remember going away and thinking, with my involvement at Eons and so on, that you were quite harsh on Archdeacon Brown. Now, listening to you today, I think you've given a much more balanced um, talk. So, was it in the process of when you were doing your research? or? Um, Yeah, thank you for those comments. I take them as a compliment. <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, that hopefully that it's become a bit more nuanced. I, 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 you know, I do, um, whether or not I was able to communicate it back then, I do personally identify with his struggle. Uh, in the midst of that, of those dilemmas, as it's been read out. Mm -hmm. So, um, and yet, I still feel it's important that we we name some things and say, okay, uh, with the with the wisdom of hindsight, uh, this perhaps could have been done in a different way. Mm. Jerry. Yes, thank you. Um, I've really enjoyed this and it's answered some questions for me um, as a former guide about how that four-fifths was disposed of. So um, thank you for that. Um, I just want you to comment on this. It wasn't always a one-way street between the Maori and the mission. Um, my address when I was a guide included some of the things that the missions were giving to the Maori and that was education in the widest sense. They were training them as carpenters and sawyers and farmers. So it wasn't always a one-way street. Uh, the missionary had met the Maori by speaking their language um, and the upshot of all of that was that the Maori gained quite a lot of the European culture in the form of um, scripture, of course, but all these other practical arts and trades and so on. Is that a fair comment? I think that's enough substance for another address in that. Um, yeah, I, the thing um, that I wanted to emphasize at the beginning and um, the, the, gain, sorry, the aim of this um, talk has really been to identify the apology, te papa, and that kind of the loss of that land. And in that I've lacked nuance you know, around some of the wider issues. But you've identified something uh, I think that's really fundamental is that, that the, the role and the um, place of the missionaries was based clearly on relationship. 
and that was one of the things I wanted to allude to at the end was the sorry state actually of the nature of that relationship at the end of Brown's life. So if we wanted to, we could actually talk about that as a whole other, you know, it's a whole other subject. Uh, you're right, it was never a one-way thing. It was actually, there was, it was mutual. Uh, there was a mutuality. Uh, I would, let me just put a writer in that. I would say that there was uh, within the colonial missionary presence uh, probably a sense of, um, uh, not to be hard again, but superiority perhaps in terms of a cultural superiority and a spiritual superiority that always, I think, uh, coloured that relationship. Uh, and um, if on balance, I would say that it was, it was an unequal relationship, but it was definitely a relationship that was mutually um, enhancing it to some degree, yeah. Thank you very much for the for the talk. Uh, uh, I do the current controversy in Tauranga at the moment about a museum. Uh, is that related w back to what you've been talking about today, or is it a totally different issue? Um, so we're s speaking firstly. Uh, it's a both and um, that. We, we need our stories to have a, a clear identity. Without clear stories, you know, we lack identity. So for me, uh, museums are living spaces or they're living uh, opportunities to be able to inform us about who we are. However, I'm not at all keen on just putting a, uh, you know, a building uh, on a piece of land and, and having some ads as in a glass um, cabinet and saying we've got a museum um, so I would rather it, um, so just getting back to the core of your story um, we've in terms of my report I've actually dreamt you know around the fact of we and uh, these are not absolute things but we could actually understand our museum in a sense begins at the strand and it moves right up the hill across the redoubts and it comes across uh, uh, the uh, cliff road then and it sweeps around here into the elms and takes us on a narrative writing over to the domain over here. Now we're really talking about, you know, holding on to a piece uh, of our story uh, that contains huge amount of stories within it. I think, you know, with some vision, if we were to see it in that way, you know, we would have something, ex you know, incredible. Uh, and, and, it, and, and it, but it would be based upon and engagement with mana whenua because for me, really the mission, sorry, the museum and where it's located is secondary in terms of this narrative to the restoration of the mana of, of mana whenua. <laughs> and so personally, you know, I've, I've put out some of my own personal thoughts of what it could look like, including the museum, but uh, this is not some, I, I feel like the first step is that, that you know, we've got this piece of land and other places around the city that we could actually build those narratives from in conjunction with Mana Whenua, and it would actually serve the purpose of, of the museum space as well. Mm. Any other questions? Yes. Kia Alistair, I enjoyed your Mangaroo. Um, I am, uh, uh, um, my name's Megan Wilson, I'm um, Ngāti Maru, uh, also a uh, descendant of traders and uh, um, Anglican. So I have this dilemma. Um, when 1928, of course, the reconciliation, the um, idea for inviting missionaries into Tauranga um, was at the same time Ngāti Maru had done their damage on this whenua. Um, I understand that to um, bring the heart back into 
the uh, tauranga, that, it, that a good citizen open forum where people can address these things without the sense of um, being hounded or beaten um, would be uh, an enriched um, state of the um, people who find themselves in different areas of for what sense of the word to become a New Zealand. Um, so I really enjoyed your impact and I've often heard of uh, Māori losing their way when you talk about tikanga um, processes where Brown brings in this emphasis that we need to, um, uh, and the treaty also says we need to re reduce the lust of the settlers and to bring this kind of um, sense of a, a better place. Um, all of this uh, is uh, food for thought, basically, and um, I appreciate adding to my um, reconciliation of um, my place within the sense of plants, where I know the treaty, it was Colenso, Colenso I, I was a plantsman, and the treaty was kind of pushed through in lots of ways, and I think with the sensitivity of that people have now, um, stories are, are, are told in layers. Um, um, I, I don't really know what our stories are, but they're told in the layers in the landscape, and uh, I can kind of read Tauranga as that um, piece, um, the, of course being Ngāti Maru, which I hold dear to my heart as well. We all have something to contribute with our ancestral trading. Um, so, um, <coughs> thank, thank you for your input into that. No other questions? I will. No? Well, um, just on behalf of everyone here today. Um, Tauranga Historical Society members, um, the Elms Foundation, I'd just really like to thank Alistair uh, most sincerely for what's been a, a very interesting, uh, compelling and thought-provoking presentation. Um, you've given us a lot to think about and uh, we look forward to thinking about that over, over the coming months and years. Um, I'd now like to invite everyone to please join us to continue the conversation with um, a cup of tea in the Fencible Cottage just over, over there. Um, so please do do so if you can. And uh, just to um, emphasise that we do have another um, presentation uh, next month. Uh, that's the 5th of August uh, here in the chapel with Brett Payne, um, who's going to be talking about um, Kinder's photography. So you'd all be welcome to uh, join us again for that. So thank you very much for coming again, and uh, kia ora. <laughs>